So I'm going to tell you about some work we've done in the context of building a WebAssembly backend for GHC. Uh, and I hope you'll leave with a little bit of an idea about how a compiler looks at control flow, uh, but even more a warm feeling for our favorite tools of functional programming. So GHC is designed to compile down to machine code. And so it has in a low level intermediate form called CMM, this represented as a control flow graph uh, that I've shown on the left. And it's got a textual representation on the right. And all these, you know, if A, go to, go to, go to, each one of those is designed to compile to a single machine instruction. But our target doesn't have go to. WebAssembly is set up with a little bit of syntactic structure. And the only real control transfer, there's an if then else, and then there's a, a continue or exit instruction. So the uh, same kind of diamond classic if control flow translates into WebAssembly very directly as an if. And in this example, I've shown the WebAssembly evaluation stack, but I just want to simplify it for purposes of this talk so that we can understand what we're looking at. So here's what we need to know about WebAssembly and its structured control flow. It's got an if then else. Uh, it's got a loop construct. That construct is a trap for the unwary because if you reach the end, it doesn't go back to the beginning automatically. It falls through. Uh, so uh, uh, I learned that two weeks ago. <laughs> Indeed, it's a, it's a, it, think of it as a label for a, back, a target for backward branch. Then you'll be OK. And then we've got a block. Uh, form that exists only to be exited from. And then here's our control flow that says uh, reach outward k times to whatever you're nested in. And if you're reaching out to a loop, go to the beginning. Anything else, go past the end. So that's what we need to, uh, need to target. So it works for nice, uh, simple if-then if forms. Here's a sort of classic. This is kind of the simplest, about the simplest loop I could write. Uh, we're going to enter A prime, uh, B prime could go back to A prime, and then eventually uh, we'll go uh, and exit the loop. And here's what the WebAssembly looks like. Uh, if your B prime wants to go back, it's going to use this BR instruction, which here acts like a continue. And then there's really no need for a break or exit instruction, uh, just reaching the end exits the loop. So this is all very nice. Uh, but not all control flow is very nice. So here's something that looks like it's got some if diamondy things, but they're all mixed together and things join back together. And Simon is here and is probably going to pester me about proc points and join points, but uh, uh, we could find something like this. I, I know. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got, uh, we're starting out with a nice little if then and B and D look okay, but now uh, when we get to if B then C else E, we kind of want to put E in here, but E also has to be reachable on this other path out of A. And we certainly don't want to duplicate it. So this is the problem that we set out to solve. Only I solved it by going to the library because I remembered in the late 60s and early 70s, people, the structured programming thing was new, and people were very obsessed with what it could do, and there's this uh, very deep technical paper by Peterson, Kasami, and Takura that has a whole bunch of results about what kind of flow graphs can you translate, and how does it work, and what can they do, and in the process, they solve this problem, uh, and it's this uh, uh, rather elaborate uh, sequence of steps that start out with a reducible control flow graph. That's just one where you don't jump into the middle of any loops. Jumping out is okay, jumping in not okay. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, sequence of things that eventually arrives at, uh, um, uh, at uh, so the structured flow that we want. But this was not something I was keen to add directly to GHC because the pros and the cons. So the pros, absolute guarantee the algorithm it, it's going to work it's going to terminate and no code is duplicated so in the translation the translated program runs exactly the same set of tests and actions as the original and there's there's no static duplication either so very very nice um, but it's not a lovely algorithm it's got three passes it's got intermediate states the control flow is messy it works by emitting code as a side effect 
uh, Simon, I, w I wouldn't want even to propose to Simon that I put such a thing into GHC. So how, how can we do better? This is kind of the state of the art, 1973. Uh, this is nicely indented for publication, but it's just a sequence of commands. There's no actual syntactic structure here of beyond the, the, uh, uh, the if then. And here's the algorithm. Try not to get too uh, distracted by the details. It is the style, if you've read The Art of Computer Programming, Don Knuth, this is the style of the time. And so it's, it's actually, it says it's got three cases and uh, we do things like if X is the terminal node T, then emit, stop, and terminate, or write, go to Y out as a side effect. And but there's a nice little hint right at the beginning. The algorithm requires the use of a last in, first out stack. So everybody know, here knows what that means, right? There must be a recursive function somewhere. So that was, that was my job, is to find the recursive function and to see if I could kind of have the, our, our, uh, our desired output syntax directly instead of having to treat it as side effects. Can we just define a recursive function that returns the syntax that we want? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, and these are really the only two functional programming techniques here. Right? The algebraic data types for the uh, representation and recursive functions for the computation. And then there's a couple of key compiler ideas that are bog standard. Uh, one is to number the nodes in the graph with a reverse post order numbering. This is just a depth first search. And the other is to use a dominator tree, which I will explain to you. But I want to start with the graph properties because the graph properties tell us what shape of code to emit when we're translating a control flow graph node. So if the node is entered by a back edge from higher numbered to lower numbered, like the loop header I showed, then the translation is going to be wrapped in a loop. And that's, that's literally all you do. You say, oh, if there's a thing, wrap this in a loop. If the node has two out edges, then its translation needs to end in if. And there's something more complicated for computed go-tos that I won't trouble you with. So that's going to tell us sort of what code to translate. And then the next question is where to put it. How do we arrange all the bits uh, in the right order with the right nesting so everything works? And that's determined by a dominance relation. And a dominance relation is a way of talking about how can you get to a place. So A here dominates B, C, and D. That A dominates B if every path from the entry point that includes B also includes A. So think of it, to get to B, you have to go through A. And the immediate dominator is the, uh, uh, is the, the one of all those, I'm just going to be informal, that's closest uh, to B. So there could be a long chain of things that you have to get through uh, to get to B. All the others, you also have to get through to get to A, but A is, A is uh, the, the closest to B. It's the immediate one. A is also the immediate dominator of C, and it's the immediate dominator of D, right? B, B, B can only go to D, um, but it doesn't dominate D because there's another way to get there. Uh, so the, the dominance structure is different uh, from the control flow structure, and it's simpler. What we're going to do with the placement is I'm going to, in, in my recursive function, at some point I'm going to be given A, and I'm going to translate A and everything that it dominates. And uh, I, the, uh, the uh, things that it dominates that are its you know, sort of direct successors are going to go inside, uh, and other things are going to follow A. Uh, so that's how my recursion is going to work. And how do I know what goes inside and what uh, follows. What goes, what follows are the merge nodes. This is anything that's reached in two different ways by forward edges. Uh, and then the other ones, there's only one way to get to B or C, those are going to go to in, uh, in, on the inside. Same thing works for a loop. So I'm going to, as I, I see the back edge, I'm going to wrap the whole, whoops, sorry. I'm going to wrap the whole translation in loop. Um, and then B is going to have this backward branch to go back to the loop header. Uh, and this is the, the translation that you saw before. So let me walk, you, oh, sorry, I couldn't really, this is totally irrelevant, but it's ICFP, and I wanted to say the dominance relation has these beautiful recursion equations. The set of nodes that dominates Y includes Y, because 
Um, every, every path that gets to Y includes Y. And it's the intersection of the dominator sets of all the predecessors. So you can read all these complicated algorithms by Robert Tarjan about how to compute this, but the concept is simple. It's really very nice. So when we look at the immediate dominators, they form a tree. C is immediately dominated by B, which is immediately dominated by A, and then all these other nodes, A is really the only thing they have in common. A is the immediate dominator of all of them. And I've highlighted here the two merge nodes, which were exactly the ones that caused trouble earlier in the talk. And now I'm gonna sort of walk through my recursive function. This is when I translate A and everything that it dominates. I'm just given this node A in the dominator tree. And in the, uh, in the code, I actually materialize the dominator tree using data.tree. I've never materialized a dominator tree before, but you know, for this, it, it was perfect. So I'm gonna get into A, and in the dominator tree, every, it's all like, the only thing you know is like, who is your parent? There, there's no ordering uh, on the children. So this is where I'm gonna go back to my depth first traversal and my reverse post order numbering. I'm gonna do the merge nodes first as I execute. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place the last no merge node at the end, and I'm gonna put a block in front of it so I can reach that merge node by exiting the block. And, whoops, so here's the, the highlight. When I, when I get down and translate F, I say, okay, here's a translation of F, um, and then stick a block in front of it, and now make a recursive call to generate what's inside that block. I'm gonna do the same thing for E, uh, and now a, a can handle its children that aren't merged nodes. I'm gonna generate this if then else. I'm gonna go ahead and make my recursive call again to translate B. It's going to uh, have an if then else. And I'm going to lay down C, which has to get to F. And then I'm not going to lay down the translation of E at all because E isn't dominated by B. I only translate the, the things that are immediately dominated by the node I've given the subtree of the dominator tree. So, how am I going to, going to get to E for the if? Well, I'm going to emit this BR instruction. And how do I know what BR instruction to uh, emit? The uh, other argument to the recursive function besides the, uh, the dominator tree is this syntactic context. So if you've, if you've ever played with an operational semantics that kind of keeps track of the context of where things are evaluated, uh, this is just the context in terms of its control flow. Uh, and I, you know, I, I get to C, it needs to go to F. I just look out of the context. What's there? Oh, this is an if, this is an if. This is the block that precedes E. This is the block that precedes F. Aha! The block that precedes F is the one I want. So um, that's, the, uh, that's a BR instruction that I'm going to emit. That's the whole thing. But it would be nice to understand why it works. And that's something I can't squeeze into a short talk. But the, the, uh, the key property is when, whenever I get to a node that has as its successor in the control flow graph something that it doesn't dominate, a merge node somewhere, it's always gonna, it's gonna look in the context and it's guaranteed always to be in the context. And that's, that's quite subtle. Um, but the, the, uh, the key properties are the, the reverse post order numbering that comes from the, the depth first search. Uh, that if I need to get from one place to the other, if I'm going forward, things are in the right place. If I'm going backward, I'm going backward to a loop header. What if I'm going backward to something that isn't a loop header? Well, in that case, the control flow graph wasn't reducible. And we know that the algorithm doesn't work. We have, if, if, if necessary, we first have to convert an irreducible control flow graph uh, to something that's reducible. Um, so the argument in the paper is a little bit depressing because there are a lot of cases, but it was the best I could do. So it's really fun to combine functional programming and compiler stuff. Uh, this is you know, sort of classic functional programming. We're going to build an abstract syntax tree, do it from the outside in, and then suddenly this you know, sort of advanced compiler comes. How many, how many people teach an undergraduate compiler course? How many people talk about the dominator tree? Steve, um, I didn't, I didn't even heard the word dominator in my undergraduate compiler course, but anyway, 
Uh, and then ordering the, the dominated tree has unordered children, we're going to use the reverse post-order numbering uh, to order them. Uh, and then a little idea from operational semantics to figure out where the branches go. Uh, so I would wrap up just by saying that you, if you pick up a compiler textbook or a compiler paper and are a bit intimidated by what you find there, don't be afraid to think recursively. It works really well. Thank you. Thank you.